Ambassador, um, the NATO summit that's taking place, the NATO summit that took place, I should say, uh, in Lithuania uh, this week, um, produced a curious development. Um, NATO said, yeah, Ukraine, you're in. But then in the same statement, they said, but there's some conditions that have to be met. And Ukraine didn't respond very favorably to that. The yeah. president said it was absurd, President Zelensky. Um, tell us what your understanding of what NATO was trying to say is and what they actually ended up saying. Yeah, so NATO leaders wanted to thread a needle. They wanted to say that Ukraine's future is in NATO. That's part of the statement. They will become a member. Uh, but this is something that they've been saying since 2008. So they also gave it some, some nuts and bolts. So they increased the, the relationship to the NATO-Ukraine Council instead of a commission. They eliminated the need for a membership action plan. Uh, they promised to work more on Ukraine's interoperability with NATO. So they said, we're going to give some practical steps. But the other side of this uh, the, this uh, vice that they were looking at is they don't want to commit to NATO membership now because that's going to get allies into the war fighting Russia on Ukraine's side. And they don't want to turn this into a NATO-Russia war. So they avoided that. In doing so, they came up with this language that says that there are conditions and that uh, Ukraine will receive an invitation when all allies agree and uh, when the conditions are met. Well, this has uh, a lot of concerns that the Ukrainians then immediately raised. Uh, first off, it's highlighting that allies don't agree on NATO membership for Ukraine. Secondly, it's saying that there are conditions, but it's not clear what they are. And frankly, if you're looking at European allies today, Ukraine has one of the largest, most capable militaries, most battle hardened. Um, they are defending the frontiers of freedom quite literally. And so to say that they're not ready, I think, is 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 missing uh, or is incorrect. It's really not fair to the Ukrainians. It's actually NATO that's not ready. You know, you, you said at the very beginning of this, they were trying to thread a needle. And I don't think they did it. Um, yeah. I don't want to heard you say you don't think they did either. So how do they clean this up? I think President Biden has a chance tomorrow. He's giving a big speech. And I think there are two things that he needs to say that he has so far not yet said, but could. Uh, one of them is that Ukraine needs to win, and we are here to support Ukraine's victory. Uh, it's got to be clear to Putin that he's going to lose the war. Uh, the second is that Ukraine will be a member of NATO. No ifs, ands, or buts, no hesitation, no conditions. They will be a member of NATO. I think that those two statements would be very strong and would still come out giving NATO a uh, a strong way forward here. That's probably going to take some doing because I think President Biden has been one of those, along with the leader of Germany, that's been pretty adamant about this not being the time. I think President Biden said a little earlier in the week, it's not the right time for yes. Ukraine. So from your perspective and your understanding, is there something that would make this the right time, uh, aside from the fact that Russia's doing what it's doing, and it's going to probably interpret this as a green light or at least um, an opportunity to continue doing what it's doing? So what would it take to change the mind yeah. of those that don't want Ukraine in immediately and, you know, uh, in, in, in the right position? Yeah. Well, you know, JJ, what the president said on the weekend is that Ukraine is not ready to be a, ma a member of NATO now. Uh, I don't think anyone is arguing that they are ready to be a member of NATO now in the sense that the war is still going on. NATO is not ready to take in a country still at war. That's not the question. The question is, what is the long term signal that we are sending to Putin and that we are sending to the Ukrainian people about where this is going? We need to send a very clear signal to Putin he is not going to win this and that Ukraine will be a member of NATO and to the Ukrainian people as well, that we will be there for them as long as it takes, as the president likes to say, including by having him in as a member of NATO. Uh, those are things that are consistent with what the president said on Sunday, uh, but they haven't been emphasized yet. 
So what do you make about uh, what do you make of uh, Zelensky's response? Uh, it seemed as if he was angry, and I'm I'm assuming, you know, rightfully so. But um, he said some things that were pretty pretty harsh. He said, "Uncertainty is weakness," and I'm wondering how you think all of this is going to play. Are people going to be understanding of that? Well, I think there will probably be some frustration with Zelensky's statements, but I think. Uh, we also have to have some sympathy. He's fighting for the life of his country. Thousands and thousands of Ukrainians have been killed at Russian hands. Uh, brutal uh, torturing of civilians, torturing of soldiers, bombing civilian targets, bombing maternity wards, kidnapping children. It is outrageous what the Russians are doing in Ukraine. So he is literally fighting for everyone's lives. And I think he does look at this and say, this is dithering on NATO's part. This is a sign of weakness. And we can't send Putin signals, signs of weakness. We need to send signals of determination and strength. So that's clearly where he's coming from. There will be some frustration with his remarks. There's no doubt about it. And I think that the task now is to still try to make clear these key things, that Ukraine must win the war, and we will help them do that. And they will be a member of NATO as soon as we can make that happen. I can't help but ask this question because of your experience with NATO, looking at your time and now, and just kind of getting a sense from you of maybe how the U.S. team and its counterparts are feeling right now, because this is a difficult time that a lot of people didn't have to deal with, but knew might be a possibility at some point because of Russia. So what's going on behind the scenes yeah. right now? That's a great question, JJ. I was never in a situation where most of the allies wanted to do something and the US was holding them back. It was always the other way around. It was always the US trying to push for solutions on policies and having to find ways to bring our allies along. Uh, so this is a very unusual circumstance. And I think uh, what people are probably uh, concerned about is the durability of US commitment to NATO overall. Uh, remember, it wasn't that long ago that President Trump called into question the U.S. willingness to defend NATO allies if they hadn't paid their share, or 2% of GDP. Uh, that was very troubling to NATO allies. And now to have another situation where um, they want to do something, but they see the U.S. is not quite there, this is going to raise some concerns. I saw a very interesting interview. I was watching BBC today, and one of the analysts that they spoke to said, essentially, what Vladimir Putin is waiting and hoping for, as far as the U.S. goes, is for former President Donald Trump to return to power and essentially put an end to the U.S. Uh, and its involvement in NATO. And essentially, um, that would po possibly spell big trouble or maybe even the end of what Ukraine's trying to do. Yeah. So do you get the sense that that may be a part of Putin's calculus? Um, I, I, I don't disagree. I think that Putin is hoping that that is the way things play out, uh, that he gets a new President Trump and that that President Trump opposes Ukraine. Those are big ifs. I don't know that we know that those are true, but that I think is what Putin's thinking is. But I want to flip that around. So we have longer time in front of us between now and the inauguration of the next U.S. president than we have seen since Russia's invasion in Ukraine in February last year. More time ahead of us. So we've seen a lot change in the last 15 months. Uh, we're going to see a lot more change before we get to that point. And frankly, if I were in the administration today, I'd be arguing for locking this down, both the Ukrainian victory and Ukrainian NATO membership, before we face the next presidential election. So in that vein, locking this down, what would your steps be? I mean, clearly Ukraine joining NATO is something at some point, but what would your steps be in terms of locking this down, making this a certainty that Ukraine defeats Russia uh, and essentially all of Europe is safe? Because as you've said before, right here on this program before, if, if Ukraine loses, so does the rest of Europe. Yes, you know, that's exactly right. And, and JJ, it's great, it's great that you emphasize that point because there won't be security in Europe again unless Ukraine is also secure. We've seen that Russia's wars affect everybody. Uh, so we have to get that part right. 
And the steps, uh, I would say the first steps now are going to be back to the battlefield. Give the Ukrainians everything we can to help them break through the front lines, retake their territory, uh, cut off the Russian forces in Crimea, do everything they can to help the Ukrainians as quickly as we can. Um, that's the first step. The second step is then we have a NATO summit meeting in Washington, D.C. in August next year. And we should be using that meeting as the time to bring this all to closure. Uh, we want to be able to come up with a formula that the areas that Ukraine uh, uh, controls at that time will be brought into NATO. Um, Article 5 will not apply to any occupied territories, and we support Ukraine's recovery of those territories by peaceful means. That's probably the best we're going to do if we get to that point in August. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll have to first make sure we help the Ukrainians on the battlefield again. Well, speaking of that, that's half of this equation. The other half that I want to talk about is Russia hasn't done a heck of a lot to help itself. And one of the most important things I want to ask you about is what happened on June 24th. Yeah. Which that was a spectacle in many different ways. A lot of people watched it unfold. Few of us to this day understand what actually happened. So... I want to hear from you what you thought as you watched that and what you think as you now are with the rest of us some days away from what happened. Uh, certainly uh, what we saw was a display of weakness uh, on the part of President Putin and the Kremlin. Uh, for a Russian armed force that under Prigozhin's leadership, march into Russia, take over two cities, get on the road to Moscow, this was shocking. This This showed everybody that the Kremlin was not fully in control. Since then, we've learned that Prigozhin didn't go to Belarus like he, like the agreement said that he would. And I'm not surprised by that at all because he would be a sitting duck there. Uh, he's probably staying where he has greater security for himself. Uh, second, we hear that he met with uh, Putin. This seems like an effort of Putin to make sure it looks like he's still in control, still in power. A, a need to demonstrate that is also a demonstration of the fact that he realizes he is weak. Uh, and it actually strengthens Prigozhin's image for him to have met with Putin in that way. And I don't think we've seen the last of this. I still think that Putin needs to demonstrate that he's the guy in charge if he's going to stay in power. And Prigozhin is a threat to that. So we, we've got many more shoes to drop. And a lot of this happening behind the curtain that we can't get behind. So as those shoes continue to drop, how do you assess the effort that Russia is putting forth on the battlefield in, in this war? Uh, at this stage, Russia is really struggling. Uh, they have lost a lot of ground, uh, even in the last uh, month or so, as Ukraine has begun its counteroffensive. This includes a lot of the territory around Bakhmut, which the Wagner forces fought so hard to take. Uh, that's now been taken back again. And uh, they are manning the defensive lines that they've put in place. These are tank traps and trenches and minefields. But the Ukrainians are gradually advancing through these very difficult obstacles. And I think with the cluster munitions that the U.S. is now providing, the speed of that advance might actually increase. And I don't think the Russians are in a position to, to do much to stop it. About those cluster munitions, what are your thoughts about the U.S. actually saying, OK, here, here they are. I mean, you know the story. They're they're dangerous. Yeah. Uh, well, my thoughts on it are we should have done it a long time ago, and I'm glad we're doing it now. The reason people are concerned about cluster munitions as a weapon is that after a conflict, you often have bomblets that are unexploded or remain behind. They're found by civilians, and civilians can get hurt by that. But we have a situation where Russia is deliberately killing civilians in Ukraine today. Every day, every night, launching you know, kamikaze drones and missiles at Ukrainian cities, hitting apartment buildings, hitting schools. Uh, so we need to make that stop quickly if we want to protect civilians. And so I think it's better to give them the cluster munitions, help them advance in the war and clean up later than to say we can't use these weapons because civilians might get hurt when, in fact, civilians are dying anyway. So as you look at what happens, you know, from day to day there, you know, you know, there's a fire here, there's a fire there, there's, a, there's an attack here, there's an attack there. And keeping up with all of that, 
Um, I know Ukraine's getting more weapons. I know they're getting more training, and I know some big things are going to come to 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 the fight a little bit later, probably in the fall or next year, et cetera. But um, once all of that is in place, will that be sufficient to win this war, or is there something else or some other things that need to take place to 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 bring this this war to a definitive end? Well, you're referring to a couple things. The the Abrams tank should get there this fall. The F-16 should get there early next year. We have still not agreed to provide ATACMs, the long-range uh, artillery systems, which we should also do. And I think that this is enough to help Ukraine cut through the lines of communication, break that southern land corridor that Russia now controls. That, in turn, will isolate Russian forces in Crimea, make them unsustainable there. That, in turn, I believe will be a very strong political signal to Russia Everyone in the Kremlin will see that Putin's war is failing. They're going to have to pull back some of their forces. And that, I think, is the beginning of the end of the war, when they can get cut off. A couple of more questions for you. I wanted to go back to Vladimir Putin's stability and what's happening inside the Kremlin at this point. Um, you know, you and others have indicated that he's weakened. Uh, and some have suggested that if this, if, 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 if Russia loses this war, he could be replaced. Um, so that suggests that there are people and perhaps an apparatus in place more powerful than Vladimir Putin. Is that indeed the case? I think what you have in Russia is a system of strong institutions, the military, the uh, intelligence services, including military and civilian intelligence services, the state-owned enterprises, a lot of oligarchs, a lot of people in and around the Kremlin, and they care about the Russian state. They find it convenient when there's stability and a strong leader in the middle who keeps it all together, this all works, they, they line their pockets, the country stays together, Russia looks strong. When that begins to fail, I think they all become very concerned. Nobody knows how to change it. You know, Nobody knows how to temp tell the emperor he has no clothes, and yet um, they actually have a lot of power there. That makes the regime fairly brittle when things go wrong and things can change very quickly. And then they can reestablish some other center of power, uh, maybe a weaker one, so that the institutions protect their own interests. We've seen this pattern in the Soviet Union. If you remember when Brezhnev died, we went through a series of Soviet leaders who were deliberately chosen to be weak leaders because these other centers of power wanted to protect their own interests. I think we're looking at something like that in the future. So then that brings me to this question, then. Um, are we better off? with the Vladimir Putin or Vladimir Putin 2.0? Well, the answer is that it's we can't choose. It's not up to us. We're not the Russian people. We're not the Russian elites who are going to make this happen. We currently have a situation of a guy with a failing state, a nuclear arsenal, and a crazy war in Ukraine where he's committing genocide. I think that's bad enough, and I think we have to stop it. How the Russians figure out what happens after, that's up to them. All right. Um, the final thing I'd like to ask you is um, you're very good at um, putting things on the table that we haven't thought about. And I think that's just one of the things that makes interviews with you always uh, a true pleasure. So what is it that we haven't spoken about or talked about or thought about today that you think is important as we consider all this going on? And there is a heck of a lot going on right now. Yeah. I think the, the number one thing I'd highlight today, JJ, is that uh, we are looking at these issues of the NATO summit, Swedish membership, what the language is about Ukraine's membership with a very short term lens. And I think we have to have a long term lens. Uh, NATO has one job and has had the same job for 75 years, which is protect the security of Europe, defend Europe and deter aggression against it. We should be learning the lesson now that in order to do that, we can't have these gray zones sitting around in Europe that Putin will attack because it ends up affecting all of us. Uh, and if he succeeds in Ukraine, he's gonna look at other pieces of the Russian empire like the Baltic states or Finland. Uh, he needs to be stopped in Ukraine for that reason, but then to prevent the next war, looking ahead, we have to make sure that Ukraine is in NATO and these other gray zones are in NATO so that he is not tempted. Ambassador Kurt Volker, thank you very much. Thank you, JJ. It's always a pleasure to be with you.